we are up to G is for genre in the ABCs of modified theology. Now, genre is the most important thing about the Bible that most people who claim to be Bible believing don't know about or acknowledge sometimes. There is nothing more important than genre when it comes to the Bible. In this week's PDF, I have a definition that comes from the pocket dictionary of theological terms, but simply stated, one must read history different than you read prophecy or differently than you read a gospel or an epistle differently than apocalyptic literature. So when somebody says the Bible says, that's a little bit of a misnomer. That would be like saying the library says, or worse, the internet says. The Bible isn't one book per se, even though it's bound in a collected work. It's a collection of 66 different books that were written over a 600 year period of time by many different men and women. So you really shouldn't say the Bible says X. You really should say in Romans, Paul says, or better yet, the epistle to the Romans says. It would be like if somebody says the Kindle said, and you said, whoa, whoa, whoa what book? What, what was the author? What was going on there? You have to do the same with the Bible. Think about it this way. It'd be like picking up a newspaper and reading exactly the same, the police report, the political commentary op-ed, the comic section, the sports, and the weather, all with the same lens. Most of us know to read the different parts in different ways. And so like when you read the weather report, you don't think this has to be 100% true or you can't trust anything that's in the newspaper. So that's why readers in the 21st century have to distinguish between the different genres and account for the nuances and differences within biblical texts. Books need to be read according to the genre that they were written in. So this requires a little bit of background work. It's by attending to the diversity within these writing styles that you hear the truth that they're trying to convey. And if nothing else, readers of the Bible are lovers of truth or should be. And so wherever that truth leads, that's where we go. Parables are perhaps the best example of this. Parables are little stories about birds or bushes or widows or farmers that come in because of their nature. They come in underneath your radar. They, they come in underneath. You don't have your hackles up. You don't have your defenses up. It, it causes you to put down your defenses and it comes in and it asks you to interrogate or to question the way things are, the assumptions that you came in with. It's trying to subvert the status quo through a roundabout way. The problem is that many of us have been taught to read parables as allegory. And in an allegory, you take each element of the story or each character and you assign to them some corresponding uh, character. And so you might have a landowner or an absentee landlord or something like that, um, uh, somebody who, the foreman on, on the plantation, whatever it is, and you say, well, that person's in charge, that must be the God character. And by doing this, you actually create some real problems. So a popular way of talking about parables is to say that they're earthly stories with heavenly meanings. But I actually prefer what Chad Meyer says, which is that they're earthy stories with heavy meanings. A parable, specifically in the gospels as Jesus used them, has two advantages of what it's up to. The first is that it's likely to make the hero of the story somebody that the listener may not have thought that highly of. This can be foreigners or servants or women or whatever it is, but it calls into question the established order and who God is favoring or working in and through. And then the second thing it does is that it questions the nature of power and wealth as a sign of God's blessing or endorsement. Take Luke 16, for example. Jesus tells this story about this beggar, Lazarus, he names him, and a rich man, which he doesn't name. And that would be a twist that would have caught the first century, his audience would have caught their attention because the reality is 
you may not have known that beggar's name. He's a nobody. But everyone in town would have known the rich man's name. So there's a reversal happening. Also in this story, they talk back and forth in the afterlife. So Jesus isn't giving us the architecture of the afterlife or heaven as if you can talk back and forth from people who are in the good place, heaven, can actually converse with the people who are being tormented in hell. Jesus isn't giving us like an ontology of how this whole thing works. He's using sort of a parody or um, an extreme setup in order to catch his listener's ear. So the danger with reading parables as allegories is that you may actually come to the exact opposite conclusion than the lesson that the parable was trying to get you to, to, to hear. Oftentimes when you read a parable in that first century context, and we have talked about E is for empire, Jesus is sort of speaking in coded language. He's not saying Rome or Caesar outright, but that the landowner or the master, he's trying to say something about the nature of power and where God is at work. Which brings me to my second point, which is that you have to read the Bible slowly. When you come in and you already think you know what the moral of the story is or what the lesson, the point that you're supposed to get, sometimes you will read very quickly and miss some very important details. I just finished reading the Gospel of Luke with our Wednesday night Bible study. And starting in Luke 11 and in Luke 12, Jesus is using this coded way of talking. We, we sort of joke about him being the Riddler um, in order to bring about some challenging assumptions. For instance, the thief in the night is something that has caused a lot of us, specifically in the second half of the 20th century in the Cold War, the left behind era, um, a terrifying uh, sense that the second coming is, is, is going to come. It's imminent and that like a thief in the night. But if you actually read Jesus' teaching on this in context, he's actually saying that the disciples should stay alert and awake because the insurrection, the revolution will come like a thief in the night. And in a counter to this absentee landlord who would have locked up his house if he had known that there was a thief coming in the night, but that the insurrection is going to come like a thief in the night. The, up, the, turning, uh, the upside down, the turning over of the established order. So to the disciples who would listen to this, you know, they were occupied in their land. Their land had been taken from them. They were paying outrageous taxes. They had no self-governance. And so this would have been an encouraging word. A thief in the night would have been a promise that your pirates and you're going to hijack the Carnival Cruise Line. Get your stuff back. He does the same sort of thing in Luke chapter 12, where he says, don't be afraid of the one who after they kill you, right? And that's the end, which sounds terrifying in and of itself. But he says, be afraid of the one, fear the one who has, after he's killed you, has the authority to cast you into hell, right? Gehenna, that garbage pit outside of town. And for the Jewish conception of the afterlife, that would have destroyed right, the possibility, the promise of living in the presence of God. It would have been a dishonorable death. And that's in verse 5. He says, the one, like the one who shall not be named. But you see in verse 6, he says, in contrast, God cares about even the sparrows and each one of you. So if Jesus was talking about God as the one who can throw you into hell... Why would he not have said God? Because it's not God. It's in contrast to God. So if you have been trained to think of the one, anytime there's the one or someone in power, of, oh, that's the God character, you actually get the 100% wrong message out of what Jesus was trying to say. So we can do this careful kind of reading with all of the genres. We can do it with history, the epic tales, poetry, proverbs, dramas such as Job and Jonah, prophetic writings, apocalyptic literature, and the epistles. By honoring the genre that they were written in and reading it slowly, instead of understanding, trying to understand the point ahead of time, 
we allow the text to speak in its own voice and we actually negate some of the odder or uglier or more confusing parts of the Bible that people find so troubling and distasteful. I could give you 50 examples of this, but a couple of weeks ago I talked about Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, where it's often quoted, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But if you actually read that slowly in context, it's actually saying that was the old way, but in Christ there needs to be no shedding of blood. Which is really interesting because when Jesus is on the cross, he says, it is finished. And it's that way of scapegoating, that sacrificial system had come to an end. So I'll look forward to talking more about G is for genre and to see what examples you want to experiment with and what rabbit trails you want to go down. But let me just say in conclusion that genre really matters when it comes to reading the Bible which leads perfectly into our next topic, which is H is for hermeneutics, or the way that we interpret.